chapter 4 eventually, back to chapter 3. Again, Pastor, thank you so much for the privilege of being here, and uh, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being an encourager. And uh, we always loved our time at the Jubilee when we were able to come a couple of times. and It's just always a blessing. I was telling Pastor, I'll go ahead and tell you, between the Sunday school and the worship hour, I said, God's giving you a wonderful church here. Uh, I said, you've got a people that love the word. I look at faces across the country and you read people, you read faces of people who love the word, of people who love each other and love what they're doing and those who are enduring to the end, amen. <laughs> and uh, you can tell this is a wonderful place of people who love God, love his word, love his man. And so thank you. Thanks for being faithful. Thank you for loving God. Thank you for loving the man of God. And, and it, this is no time to slow down, back down, or move around. It's time to be faithful. Amen. And so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. And I do pray for our family. Uh, we'll be making one trip out in April. And we'll be on the road pretty much the whole month of April. We'll start out in Louisiana to Arkansas, to Kansas, to Colorado, to Utah, to Idaho, back to Kansas, back to Louisiana. And then home again in that trip, we'll be looking for a home when we're out in Utah. And so pray that God gives us wisdom and direction as far as finding the place to live. We'll be moving in May, the end of May this year. So a lot going on in 2021 our, in our family, in our life. And so uh, do pray for us uh, that God will give us wisdom. God will give us direction each step of the way. Uh, but do pray for this. And, and many have asked, as we've been in churches in recent weeks and months, you know, what can we pray for you about? We know it's time. It's transition time. And what can we pray for your family about? What can we pray for the work about? And my request has been this. Uh, I know we're sowers. That's all we are. As Christians, we're sowers of the seed. Uh, that, that's our responsibility. That's what Jesus described us as. We're sowers. The seed is the word of God. But as Jesus gave that parable of the sower and the seed, we realized something very important. It's, it's not the seed. It has the power. We understand that. There, there's no deficiency or lacking in the seed. It'll get the job done. There can be issues with the sower if we're not faithful to sow the seed. But as long as we're sowing the seed, the power is there. Amen. The power is there to change a life and to save a soul to do the work. But the key in that parable beyond the faithfulness of the sower was the preparation of the soil. Whether it be stony soil, thorny ground, good ground, whatever the case may be, we realize that the soil preparation is critical for the success of the seed. And so our request has been for the church that have been in, please pray for the hearts of Utah. Because God knows how to prepare the hearts of the people for the seed of the word. And so that's all we're going to go do. I can't save anyone. I can't change a life. But I know a God who can. Amen. I know a God who can save to the uttermost. I know a God who can transform lives. And so uh, please pray that God will begin working now as we've traveled across the country. Many times we're in church and folks will come up. If they have a Mormon background or know someone in that background, they'll come up and they'll talk to us and uh, they'll sort of share their story. I met a, a gentleman in a camp meeting up in Virginia, West Virginia, and uh, he pastors a Baptist church. He was raised in, the, in a Mormon home. And uh, his dad was an elder in a local ward. And uh, I'm like, okay, what happened? <laughs> uh, how did that happen? What was the... What was the, the uh, the way that God brought you to a place of salvation. And he gave me a story that was very similar, not in detail, but in principle to almost everyone we've talked to who's gotten saved out of Mormonism. And he said, I came to a crisis point in my life. I came to a place in time, uh, and again, a lot of times it's family, it's other issues, but they're facing some hardships or trials, and they start looking for answers, and they can't find the answer. Not in Mormonism, not in, not in their church. They can't find it. And uh, he said it. And, and, and again, it, sometimes it's a little Baptist church. There was a gentleman out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We were in a church there, and he came up, and I said, what happened? Again, he's sharing his story. Same principle. Was going through a hard time, a crisis in life, different circumstances, but the same principle. And he said, I, I just started looking for truth. I started looking for truth. And he said he ended up at a little Baptist church somewhere in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he said, I heard the gospel for the first time. 
And he said, I got saved by the grace of God. And so pray with us that God will prepare the hearts of those who are going to hear. And we're excited. I mean, I said during Sunday school, we can't wait to see what God's going to do. Not only there, but here. I, I'm excited for Christiansburg and, and, and this church and your pastor. And I'm excited about what God's going to do in 2021. Amen. Amen. Because God's not dead. Amen. He's still alive. He's still on the throne. And uh, so again, we'll be praying for you guys. Acts chapter 3, if you're able, let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God. Acts chapter 3. I want to begin here and, and just take a thought. And from the latter part of the verses that we'll read, then we're going to look at two, maybe a couple, three different passages of Scripture uh, to sort of share a, a thought with you this morning. I again, love the book of Acts. We looked at a little bit at Acts chapter 1 during the Sunday school hour. But I love the book of Acts as it tells the story of the church and how the church began the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and uh, the first missionary journeys and how the church began to grow. I love Acts 17, 6 when the Bible says uh, of the unbelievers as the uh, Paul and others are on a missionary journey, they said those that have turned the world upside down are coming hither also. Yeah. The church in the early days had a testimony that whether, wherever they went, they turned the world upside down. Church, we got to get back to that mindset. Amen. We got we got to get back to getting excited about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, they didn't have churches on every corner in those days. There were no churches. I mean, where they went, it was brand new. It was full of idolatry and wickedness and immorality. I mean, Israel's under Roman bondage. Most of the world is at that point in time. There was no freedom of religion as we have in the sense of our comprehension. But they're excited about Jesus. We're going to get to that point. But Acts chapter 3 gives us one of those early stories. Verse 1, the Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you again and praise you. For the place we can come, the meeting house, Lord, to meet with the people of God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for the privilege to open the word of God and to study, God, to read and to preach the truth contained in the very words of God. Lord, I pray you'll speak to hearts this morning. May you encourage your children. May you bring conviction on those who do not know you as Savior today and draw them to yourself as Savior and Lord of their life. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. One of the issues in going to Utah and dealing with that culture, it's a very different culture, uh, but it's a very friendly culture at, by and large, very family friendly. Uh, the Mormon cult or religion, if you will, is very family oriented in many ways. And so it's very safe most of the time, though you have crime there like you have anywhere else. It's generally a, a safe community. When we began to read and study about the state when the Lord was leading us out there, we found, man, that's a pretty nice place to live. It's a beautiful place. It's, it's you know, geographically, it's beautiful. Uh, a lot of scenery. We're in the mountains. You say, well, we're in the mountains. Well, this is a 4,200-foot mountain, uh, and that's in the valley, not on the top. <laughs> that's in the valley where we live. So it's a little bit higher than what we're used to, but it's beautiful in that way. It's a fairly safe place, and a lot of religion, but no knowledge of Jesus Christ. No knowledge of the freedom that comes in having your sins forgiven. The whole system is a works-based system in which a people or individuals in Mormonism are seeking to become God. That's their goal. That's their desire. And so they want to be good. They want to be successful. They want to be nice. They want to have big families. They want to create an outward appearance of success and goodness because that's what God would do. But the stark reality is inside they're just as empty as any other lost person. That's the reality. 
the use of antidepressants and really immorality and those types of things are rampant in that region and it's behind the scenes it's sort of hidden you'll never see it out front but when you begin to read and study very much about all that goes on it's a very depressed place because there's really no joy there because if you're trying to be God and live to perfection every day you look in the mirror you realize it's not there <laughs> I mean, you can work and work and work and strive to be perfect and good and righteous, but at the end of the day, you realize in the mirror you're not. You can never, you just can never measure up because they don't know the joy of salvation. They don't know the peace of God that passes understanding. And yet I'm afraid the reality is that's what all sinners are. That's where they are in life. They're just living life. They're doing their thing. They're going about their daily lives apart from Christ and trying to feel some type of joy or peace or happiness with success or relationships or other substances that they may put in their body, but they're all in search of peace. The reality is without Jesus, you'll never know that peace. Without Jesus Christ, you can never ever find that peace you may find pleasure the bible said there's pleasure in sin for a season but it also says the wages of them will always be death you say well then how do you find real peace how do you find real joy that no matter what your circumstance no matter what your situation it never changes because that peace is not based on you it's not based on what you can do it's not based on what you've done but it's based on something that's been given to you well, friend, that's the basis of what we call Bible salvation. Being born again by the grace of God. I remember talking to a gentleman who's been a number of years ago when I was pastoring him. And, and again, if you live around the Bible Belt much or you're around uh, church folks very much, sometimes you meet guys or gals that will just make off-the-wall statements. You're like, where'd you come up with that one? And this fellow made this table time. He said, oh, and I can't remember the context of what he was saying or how, but basically was that saying you need to be saved wasn't biblical because saved wasn't in the Bible. And I'm like, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> you, you must pick up the wrong book somewhere because salvation is all throughout the Scripture. From the beginning in Genesis 3 when God came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden and he found them and if you will, he saved them. All right, He provided a covering for their sin. He provided forgiveness for their sin from Noah who found grace in the eyes of God in Genesis chapter 6 all the way into the New Testament. God is always about salvation. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, The Son of Man hath come to seek and to save that which was lost. We'll see on over in chapter 4 of Acts. They were preaching, There's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. You see, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You say, Who is that? That's everybody. The great joy of the gospel, the great joy of the church, and the great joy of preaching is you can never preach to the wrong person. Amen. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. It doesn't matter how good they are. It's not about income. It's not about IQ. It's not about success or failure in life. We are all sinners in need of a Savior before you're born again. So it's an exciting message to share. But I wanted to share a thought with you this morning on salvation. Salvation, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? There's some who would convince you today or try to convince you in the world, well, oh, everybody's got their religion, and as long as you're sincere and as long as you have religion, you'll be okay. Well, that sounds maybe philosophically good, but it's scripturally wrong. In fact, it's very, very dangerous scripturally because the Bible says in Acts 4, we'll look at it in a moment, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, the salvation that the Bible teaches and the salvation that Jesus proclaimed was a very exclusive salvation. Salvation came by one man, Jesus Christ. He came one way, by grace through faith. But it was extended to whosoever. You see, that's the beauty of biblical salvation. It's a gift offered to everybody. To everybody. But what difference does it make? 
It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed, a man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. You see, in our modern generation, we, they, they've been really fighting and working. Satan has for the last 100 plus years, about 150 years, to convince man that we're nothing more than animals. We're something in the evolutionary chain somewhere started from a microbe, you know, developed our way up to an amoeba. From the amoeba, we eventually became a tadpole to a frog to reptiles on up to a monkey and an ape. And eventually we became the glorious man that we are. <laughs> because they want us to think we're nothing more than animals. But the Bible says man is not an animal. Man was made in the image and likeness of God. We're not animals. Sometimes man may act like an animal, but he's not. Man has a God consciousness. Animals can do what they please. And I, I, I get cracked up and I can't get distracted. i got to get back to my, my train of thought here. But I, I get tickled. I laugh sometimes thinking about this whole evolutionary process and them saying that we're no different than animals. And I'm like, have you ever watched dogs or, or lions in the field? You know, as human beings, we have a conscience. We have an awareness. We, we have a sense of guilt or shame or right or wrong, correct? Or at least we should, okay? And we see bad things happen to other people or and other creatures and, and it makes us feel bad and we create all sorts of organizations to save the whales and save the animals and that's all right but anyway I don't want to get down that trail either we need to be more concerned with saving man Amen. but did you realize this there's never been an animal organization that joined together to save the whales you know if dogs get hungry they're going to eat whatever's there and they don't care what it is if a lion gets hungry, they're going to eat the closest monkey or gazelle or whatever they can get to, and they don't care what it is. They don't care if it's a mom. They don't care if it's a daddy. They don't care if it's a baby. They're going to eat because they're hungry. Why? They're an animal. They're an animal. They do what animals do. They have no conscience, and they have no God consciousness. Why? Because they're an animal. Man is not an animal. Man has a conscience. Man has an awareness of right and wrong, good and evil. We always make those judgments. We're determining what's safe, what's not safe, what's right, what's wrong, what's moral, what's immoral. Why? Because we're not an animal. We've been made in the image and likeness of God. We have a knowledge of God and an awareness of God. Anywhere you travel around the world, it doesn't matter whether it's in the deepest jungle, in the faraway lands, whether it's in the urban centers around the world, you will find find individuals worshiping something. They may worship a tree. They may worship the sun. They may worship the stars. They may worship other things. But they'll be worshiping something. There will be some system of right and wrong, of moral and immoral within that culture. Why? Because we are not animals. We were created in the image and likeness of God say why is that important it's critically important because when an animal dies he goes back to the dust he's done it. had a student class when I taught down in North Carolina came in one day and said Mr. Moore said said uh, my, my dog or my cat I can't remember which one it was it died is it in heaven I said mm, got bad news <laughs> I said no I said little Fifi died you bury them they go rot they're done you know worms have a meal we're over I didn't say it quite that way but you know I said, it's, it's just an animal. It's just an animal. We love them. We care for them. They care for us. But it's an animal. That's the goal. She came back a few days later with a little excerpt from a religious periodical that said, if an animal make you happy, I'm sure God will have your pet in heaven. I said, go burn that. You don't need that. <laughs> but animals are animals. They go back to the dust. But we as humanity, men, women, boys and girls, we're eternal. We were made in the image and likeness of God. We were built to spend eternity somewhere. And God even tells us where our choices are. Isn't that amazing? God said there are two destinations. Two. It's very clear. There's a heaven, which is where he is. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I mean, he even describes it in detail, the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, he describes what heaven will be like and, and, and all the beauties and the splendor and the glories of heaven. He even tells you the option. He even gives you an understanding of the option if you don't go to heaven. He said there's another destination, and he said it's a place called hell. And he even describes it in great detail and goes into the details of how horrible and the blackness of darkness forever and all 
the things and the pain and the suffering and the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. He goes on and on and on to describe the horrors of hell. And then he says, and you get to choose. You get to choose. He said, I'll describe the glories of heaven. I'll describe the horrors of hell. He said, but you must choose where you want to be. He said, the bad news is this. You can't get to heaven on your own because heaven is a place of perfection and beauty and glory where God is. And since you're all sinners, there is a little issue there. He said, but because I love you so much, he said, I will give my only begotten son, his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be born of a virgin, who will live a sinless life, who will willingly give his life on Calvary and take upon us a penalty for our sins. He will take that sin debt upon himself. He will willingly give his life. He'll be buried for three days and then he'll rise again victorious over death, hell, and the grave paying your sin debt for you. Because there's no way you get to my heaven as a sinner. You must be saved forgiven of your sins. He said, I love you so much I'm going to pay that for you. But you got to choose. The choice is yours. I mean, it's still clear. You're an eternal creature. You're not an animal. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. There's so many things that I, I, I could go down so many roads. My, my mind is just running a thousand miles a minute of how God has revealed his love and the truth of the gospel to us. Nothing lives without sunlight, correct? You throw darkness in, nothing really lives. It just creates an, air, an element of death. That's right. Because if there is no sun, there is no life. God is teaching us about his eternal grace and love. Without the S-O-N, there is no life. There is no life. There is no life without the sun. Amen. The sun. The sun. The sun is the gear of life. Hey, how does that life come? It rises every day. Amen. It's a resurrected sun that brings life. I mean, there's so many things, even in creation, that God has revealed to humanity that he loves us. The life is in his S-O-M, that that sun is a resurrected sun that comes from the grave every single day. Why? Because God knows. You've got two destinations for eternity. You can't, you can't spend eternity in both. You can only be in one. Can I ask you a question this morning? Which one are you going to? Where are you headed today? Are you headed to heaven? Or are you headed to hell? So how do I head to heaven? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 3, 9, 4, by grace... Are you saved through faith? That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, how you go to heaven is not joining the Baptist church or getting baptized and, and reading your Bible, and all those are good things and they're biblical things to do and they're right things to do, but they don't save you. You are saved when you acknowledge that you're a sinner, when you acknowledge that Jesus paid your sin debt on Calvary, and by faith you put your trust in him. By the way, faith is not what you know, it's what you believe. There's a big difference, and I, I'm going to give you this quick because i got to hurry, or we'll be here the evening service, so let me hurry, amen. Faith, faith is not what you know, it's what you believe, all right? That's why in Romans chapter 10, he says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Saving faith is not a head issue, it's a heart issue. Get that. Saving faith is not a head issue. It's a heart issue. It's not what you know. Well, I know about Jesus. I've heard the story. I've seen the Christmas play. I've been to an Easter service. I've been to Resurrection Sunday. I know all that, but do you believe it? And I'm not going to believe it in your head. Do you believe it in your heart? Say, why the heart? The heart is the seed of the Bible of your will, your desire, your emotion. That's your heart. When he speaks of your heart, he's not talking about necessarily the thumping organism. It's the seed of your will. That's why he said, son, give me thine heart. He's not saying, give me your thumping organism muscle. He's saying, give me your desire, your will, your want to. You see, salvation comes when your will, your desire, you want to, receives the gift of salvation by faith. Well, how do I know God will save me? It's faith for him. You know it because he said it. You know he'll forgive you because he said he would. You know he'll save you because he said he would. You know he paid your sin debt because he said he did. 
You know you're going to heaven because he said you would. By faith. It's faith. You must believe it in your heart. I've oftentimes used this illustration for faith. No trick questions. No preacher sometimes asks trick questions. I'm not asking any trick questions. These are all these are all plain common sense stuff. What is this? Chair. Everybody agrees it's a chair. All in favor say amen. All right. What is it for? Again, no trick questions. It's common sense stuff. What is it for? To sit in. Everybody agree with that? All in favor say amen. Amen. This is Baptist church. We've got to do that tonight. I got another question. No trick questions. Based on what you know about this chair, is it sufficient to hold me up? All in favor say amen. Amen. Now, I believe everything you said. I believe everything you told me. I do believe it's a chair. I do believe it's to be sad. And I do believe it's sufficient to hold me. I do. But I get a question. Have I put my faith in that chair? But I believe what you said. I believe everything you told me. I believe it's a chair. I believe it's to be said. And I believe it'll hold me. I don't doubt anything you told me. But have I put my faith in that chair? I'm afraid we've got a lot of people who know all the information, but they never sat in the chair. They could give you all the answers. They could fill in all the blanks. But their life's never changed. They don't know the joy of his salvation. They don't know the peace of God that passes understanding, which only comes to those who put their faith in him. Again, it's not going about the chair. It's not even leaning on the chair. Some people want to use God as a crutch, so they just lean on him when they're struggling. That is salvation for him. Again, I, I've seen folks come to the altar bawling, crying, their life's mess, they need help. But they just want to have the problem. They just want a crutch. They don't want salvation. They want a crutch. As soon as they get better in life, they don't, oh, they don't need him. Why? Because they never trusted him as their Savior. You know what salvation is? Salvation is when you put your absolute, complete, without reservation, trust in Him. That is faith. That is faith. And that's what it takes to save you. Nothing more, nothing less. Just faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without reservation, without hesitation, completely trusting that Jesus is sufficient to save your soul. And that's what salvation is. That's what salvation does for you and I. In fact, when you learn how good it is, you'll even stand on that salvation. And if I was brave, I'd jump up and down when I wouldn't do that. Hey, Amen. I trust him, and I don't trust this chair that much. But I mean, you get excited because you know what the chair will do. You know what Christ will do. And the more you learn of him and the more you grow in him, the more you're excited about telling others about what he's done and what he'll do in your life. But i got a question. Have you ever sat down? You see, if you've never sat down, you're still unstable. You're still walking around the chair. You know everything there is to know about the chair, but you just ain't in the chair. Because when you ever sit down in that chair for the first time, it changes everything. I mean, it just literally changes everything. Salvation. What difference does it make? I'm going to give you three points. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to give you just three quick verses real quick. Well, salvation, what difference does it make? Can I ask you this morning, do you know there's been a place and point in time in your life that you've been saved by the grace of God? And when we use that term, saved by the grace of God, we mean that place in time where you acknowledge to God that you're a sinner in need of salvation and you ask Him to forgive you of your sin to change your life. I have no idea how you would express that because everybody would express that in different words. There's not a, a set formula of words you say. Though it is going to be something you say. For the heart man believes the righteous with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The dying thief on the cross simply said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But do you remember a time I don't, I don't remember the day. I, know, I, I don't remember. The, if you were to ask me if my eternity hinged, Pastor, on me telling you the exact date and month and year that I got saved, I'm in trouble. Because I don't remember all those details. I think it was a fall revival on a Thursday or Friday night. You say, oh, preacher, what if it was a Thursday or Friday? I don't care. That's right, yes. 
I was there. I know what happened. I'm really not interested in whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But I was there. I remember the night that I acknowledged I was a sinner. I mean, I was overwhelmed. Even as a young man with my guilt as a sinner, I felt the condemnation of God because I knew if I didn't trust him, I was going to hell. And I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to die as a sinner. I wanted to be forgiven more than anything. I could take you to the pew I was in. I could do that. Mount Calvary Baptist Church, Rhonda, North Carolina, three sections of pew. Mom and Daddy always said second row back on the right side. I was about the third or fourth person in wearing my cowboy boots. I do remember that part. I remember the preacher preaching on salvation and Jesus and the love of God and heaven and hell. And I remember knowing in my heart that if I didn't get saved, I was going to hell and I didn't want to die without God. I didn't want to die and go to hell. And I remember when he gave the invitation, I remember getting up out of that row and coming down on the left side of the altar, bowing my head and saying, God, please save me. I know I'm a sinner. I want you to forgive me. And he did. What month it was, I'm not worried about. What day it was, I'm not worried about. What I want to know is, were you there? And do you have a time in your life when you sat in the chair? Figuratively speaking. Is there a time in your life you know you put your faith and trust in Christ? And you settle it. It's done. Because it makes a difference. What difference does it make? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, one of my favorite verses. There's a whole message in this whole text. But 2 Corinthians 5, 17, what difference does it make? The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The night I got saved, even as a nine-year-old boy, flip on over to Ephesians chapter 2. Even as a nine-year-old boy, it changed my walk to it. I mean, I, I knew I was raised to go to church and do my thing, but all of a sudden when I got saved, I inside of me, I really wanted to do those things. I had a desire and a hunger to do those things. Hey, I wasn't super spiritual. My flesh still wanted to stay home on Sunday nights and watch Walt Disney. You know, all that kind of thing. My flesh still wanted to stay home and watch the Super Bowl or all those carnal things that weren't going to do anything for me. But the Spirit of God said, son, you don't need to do that. You need to be at church. <laughs> and my flesh would say, the Lord, only one Sunday a year. <laughs> and God said, well, what if it's your last Sunday of the year? You see, all of a sudden, once I became saved, I was a new creature. All things were passed away. Behold, all things become new. What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world for the sinner. It makes all this in the world. Look at Ephesians 2. And you, verse number 1, hath he quickened. That word quickened means to be made alive. And you hath he quickened who were dead and trespassed and sinned. For in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Look at verse 4. But God, uh, yeah. hallelujah, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, for with he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Uh, what difference does it make? Well, for the sinner, it brings you new life. What difference does being saved? For the sinner, it means you have a new life, a new life. You were dead, now you're alive. You were guilty, now you're free. It changes everything. It changes everything. Go back to our text, if you will, in Acts chapter 3. People say, why did he get saved? Because it changes everything. What difference does it make? For sinner, they're free, they're forgiven, they're born again by the grace of God. But I want you to see beyond that. Look in our text we read in Acts chapter 3. Really, this is what threw this whole thought into my, into my heart and my spirit. Look at verse 9 and 10. Okay, here's the lame man, and again, there's too much in this text to back up and deal with, but he's been that way for many, many years. Everybody knows his physical condition. But all of a sudden, Peter and John, they, uh, they come by, they walk by, look on earth, verse, verse number 4, verse 6, you and gold have I none, but, in, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk, he took him with the right hand, verse 7, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Notice verse number 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. All the people saw him. Yeah. Verse 10, here's the thought, and they knew. 
They knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate. What difference does salvation make for the unbeliever? It's a new life. But for those around us, it's a new testimony. For the unbeliever, salvation means a new life. But for our friends and family and acquaintances, our peers, those around us, it means a whole new testimony. Before salvation, we were the one who couldn't walk. We were the one who's helpless. We were the one who's always begging for everything. We were the one who were a ne'er do well. But when we met Jesus, what's he doing walking, leaping, and praising God? What's, what's he doing? Something's happening in his life. By the way, salvation is one of the greatest testimonies to those around us because true biblical salvation will change your life. It always changes your life. What difference does it make for the sinner? It means a new life. For those around you, it means a new testimony. Thirdly, look in chapter number four, and we're done. Chapter number four. What difference does it make for the sinner in your life, for, the, for those around us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, a new testimony? But look in Acts chapter number four. Look down at verse number 12 again. Peter here giving testimony. Neither is there salvation in the other, for there's none of the name. Given a, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Look, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They took knowledge of them. They had been with Jesus. Verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them. Look at the last part of verse 14. They could say nothing against it. Salvation brings a new life to the sinner, it brings a new testimony to those that we are encountered with. But it brings a new witness to the skeptics. Every time somebody gets saved, salvation, what difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. Because it's in layers. Some of you here today, you're lost. You need to be saved. You say, me? Yeah, you. Say, why? Well, you know all about the chair. You just never said I need it. <laughs> you can fill in the blanks all day long, but you've never had a point in your life where God's changed you. And the Bible said, if a man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're not saved by good works, but you are saved by two good works. Before you got saved, you were dead in trespasses and sin. Once you got saved, you were quickened, you were made alive, and the Holy Ghost came to live within you. By the way, when God moves in, you're going to know it. Okay, it, uh, you know, I said earlier today, I, my life's still in process. God's teaching me. God's growing me. God's shaping me. And I've been saved for 42 years. But I'm going to tell you something. The day I got saved, God changed my course. God changed my desire. God moved me from a dead old sinner that didn't care to a child of God who was conscious of those things, who was very sensitive to right and wrong and sin. And when sin came in, I felt dirty. I felt guilty. I felt shame. I wanted to get clean. I wanted to get things right. Maybe somebody here today has just never been saved. You have a head knowledge but no heart possession. What difference does it make? It'll give you peace you've been looking for for years. Preacher, I am saved, but what difference does it make? If you're truly born again living for the Lord, everybody around you knows. One of my deacons, when I pastored, he was saved out of really a rough, rough life. He spent some time in Vietnam. He was never in the front lines. His brother was a door gunner and a chopper in Vietnam, so... He never was sent to the front lines because that's where his brother was. He was rough. He was in drugs. He was in alcohol. Came home. Would have spent his life in the military, but he punched his sergeant, so he ended up in the brig. They gave him the option of getting out or go to prison. <laughs> he opted out. Amen. Came home, still lost. Family a mess. Him and his wife had one little boy. He'd been in North Carolina. Black Mountain was a dry out place. He'd been to every program you could name it. He was still lost. His family was about to blow apart. But his brother had gotten saved, was going to church where I pastored, and this was years and years ago when I was a little boy. And invited him to come for Mother's Day. That's where his mom went to church. Jane came to church. Got under deep conviction. Got gloriously saved. <laughs> a drunkard who AA couldn't help met Jesus and his life was transformed. <laughs> he said his buddies would come on Friday and Saturday like, hey James, ready to go? We'll go carp fishing or catfish and go spend a night. He's like, can't go boys. Well, what's the matter with you? He said, I got saved. Ah, it'll pass. <laughs> it did. <laughs> I don't know, 30 some years now, he's a deacon Sunday school teacher. His son's missionary. Do y'all know Jamie Erica Smithy? 
Okay, missionaries to Chile, South America. He was the first preacher called into our ministry. That's James' only son. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Salvation, what difference does it make? It changes the life of the sinner. It changes the testimony to the observer. But it changes the witness to the skeptics. They can't deny a changed life. I mean, they, they didn't like Peter preaching, but how could they argue with the product? I mean, how could they argue? I mean, here they're like, you can't do that. But here's this guy walking who was lame, whose life had been gloriously transformed. That's why it's so critical for you and I as God's children to live for God every day, to serve God every day, to honor God every day. Why? Because the skeptics are watching. And for salvation to mean anything to the skeptic, it must be real in the life of the redeemed. What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. Because remember, there's only two destinations. Here this morning, you're going to one or the other. That's simple. You're going to heaven by the grace of God, or you're going to hell because you've rejected it, and it's your choice. God loves you enough that he gave his only begotten son to pay your debt. Don't look at him. Oh, God, if you love me. No, no, no. He gave his very best. He allowed his son to take your sin on himself, and he didn't deserve it. He took my sin on himself to the point that the Bible says in the crucifixion, he turned his back on his son. Why would God turn his back on his son? Because he had placed our sin on him. But the beauty of Calvary is it didn't end there. <laughs> the beauty of Calvary is he took our sin then. He gave up the ghost and cried, it is finished. And they put him in the tomb and said, hey, it's over. <laughs> but three days later, yeah. mm, can I tell you what changed the life of the disciples? Because they're all depressed when Jesus died. They're all depressed, everybody. Nobody believed in the resurrection. We give the women a lot of credit because they came to the tomb, but mind you, they brought ointment for his burying. They didn't come with picnic lunch waiting to eat with him. They thought he was still in the ground too. Right? They just loved him like mom and, and ladies would, and they were coming to anoint his body for the burial. And when he was out of the ground, like, where did you put him? What did you do with his body? Where did he go? And then that's him, the gardener. <laughs> Don't touch me. Yeah. He said, go tell the disciples and Peter. They could go run and tell him. They said, he's alive. He's alive. They're like, you're kidding. Ain't no way. <laughs> it didn't happen. They come running to the two. Peter goes flying in. He's gone. He's gone. Where's he at? You see, they knew Jesus could raise the dead. They saw him do it. They knew he could walk on water and feed the multitude. They had seen him do it. They had walked with him and talked with him. But what happens when the dead raiser's dead? Who raises him? Because they understood much of who he was in a general sense, but they had yet to come face to face with Jesus was God. He had power to give his life, and he had power to take it up again. And when they came face to face with a risen Savior, what was there to fear in life? What was there to fear in life when you serve the one who's conquered death? You see, that salvation. It's not a get out of hell free pass. That's not what it is. It's life. It's real life. It's living without the fear of sin and its penalty because it's paid for. It's living without the fear of dying and death because it's been conquered. That's what salvation is. Heaven is the icing on the cake where we get to spend eternity with Him. But do you know it? Have you been saved? And if you have, show me. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you and praise you for this time together. And God, as you burden my heart with this message, and Lord, these thoughts. God, I've been burdened for some time now. For the salvation of souls more than usual.
Lord, as you begin to lead my thoughts this morning, Lord, you know my heart's prayer and my heart's desire. It's Lord, that if there's anyone in this building this morning that does not know Christ as their Savior, Lord, that today would be the day they would let us take the Word of God and show them how to simply put their faith and trust in you. Father, that today could be the day of their salvation. Father, for I pray these things in the name of my Savior and your precious Son, Jesus. We stand to our feet with heads bowed and eyes.